Uh, all right, let's kick us off. So, um, I'm Patrick, it's my LinkedIn QR code. Uh, so I've got a, a, a bit of history with uh, Data Vault, blogging about Data Vault. I joined Snowflake about two and a half years ago, and uh, we've internally seen a lot of increase in uh, interest in Data Vault, especially in the last two years. Uh, and because of this and uh, collaborating with multiple customers and prospects around the world, there are some common themes or some common questions that come up which um, I've gathered already, I've done demos before. Uh, this is kind of the latest iteration of some of the things that you should consider when you're modeling and building content on Snowflake. So a uh, bit of a rundown on what it is. Um, it is a technical presentation. Unlike the, the, the conference presentation, this, this is more deep dive stuff. Um, maybe a way of thinking about modeling your content on, on Snowflake, um, either information wise, dimensional models, or, and, you know, hopefully data vault as well. Um, and some, some of the constructs that you are probably familiar with and how it performs on, on Snowflake. So, uh, for those unfamiliar with Snowflake or those familiar with Snowflake, it's just a reiteration of what the architecture looks like. Uh, Snowflake has never been an on-prem, uh, system. It's always been native cloud, um, and that sort of thinking is really important because it's not like taking a Teradata and put it into the cloud and just make it work or put a SQL server and have it run on an EC2 instance and have it work. What Snowflake have done is, is taken the, the, the data components most familiar that most people use and use that and constructed that into an architecture that supports originally data warehousing, but it's growing to, to much more, more like a data platform. Um, the reason why I, I, I emphasize this at the start is because um, underneath Snowflake automates uh, compute for your queries and storage in Snowflake tables, um, all managed through a cloud services layer of its own that takes care of transaction management and security and, and so on. Uh, those compute services, those uh, um, virtual warehouses that you use to run your queries come in T-shirt sizes. Um, essentially, they're EC2 instances if you're on AWS underneath. So they're virtual machines. And what that implies is that each one of them comes with their own memory. And therefore, if you construct your queries or the way you run your analytics per day, you take advantage of that cache. Um, there's also a result cache that sits on the cloud services layer that, that, uh, lives 24 hours. You run a result, uh, against, uh, the, the, the data that you're querying. It stores the result for 24 hours, uh, as long as the source of that data does not change and you're not using a, a context function like current uh, user or current time or something in that query. So, uh, that makes a huge difference. Uh, it's probably the first uh, performance tip uh, to today is, um, for instance, if you were to design your daily analytics to uh, pre-process some queries for the day and nothing changes for the day, then throughout the day, uh, people would be using or your business users will be using the result case instead of going all the way down to the remote storage, right? Um, a lot of these concepts, and I wanted to emphasize this point as well, is available in the blogs um that's been posted in snowflake blogs so a lot of this detail on, on how caching works and how the first query works and how it actually grabs that result cache has all been documented and um put into plain english so you you kind of focus on what works for you from from the architecture so um good thing to understand the architecture um the other other point the last point about this is of course because this is in the cloud um, even though it's in one deployment or one VPC, um, there is still network traffic between these components, right? And to understand that is, it would also helps in a way how to design your queries and how to design your models, which we'll get into as well. So, um, the very first thing, uh, when we go into a customer site as a professional services delivery, um, portion of Snowflake is okay if you're struggling with performance uh, uh, on the platform 
the first answer is not to say upsize the warehouse, right? The first answer is to say, well, what, ha what have you modeled? How have you modeled your data? And to understand that is to understand how micro partitions work in Snowflake. So Snowflake's native um, storage medium is micro partitions, which is uh, compressed and encrypted by default, 16 megabyte partitions. And there can be one of them or as thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. However, what you interact with is a table. So Snowflake manages all, all the, uh, the, the files and the allocation of files to the metadata you interact with is a table. So if we take this example of a dimension, say it's key, uh, hash diff, start date, end date, physicalized end date, and you load data into that table, it naturally clusters. And what I mean by cluster, cluster is if I was to look at, at uh, how the micro partitions are loaded, um, you can see that the start date increases as more micro partitions are loaded, right? That's just for an insert. And every time you do, it's physicalized as an immutable set of files, which are called micro partitions. Now, what happens when you do an update, right? Because of the, the files are immutable, um, there is no, there is no uh, update permitted on the file itself, but the update is performed against the table. So what you see uh, is an update to a table. What happens physically underneath is that we've created new micro partitions to store the new state of those records, right? So for in this example, we do an update against the key three and uh, you can see that, all right, now March is the new uh, low date and the high date is December uh, 99. But we also copy the old state of the record and update that uh, end date to show that that record's been end dated, right? And what you also notice is for some reason, uh, the ID four is also there again. The reason for that is because um, it's now part of the active micro partitions for that table. So what, I, what about, I mean by that is if you look at the active micro partitions from a metadata standpoint, um, this is what your table looks like. We've done an update against ID three, so the record is closed and there's a high date record and you can see uh, uh, ID four as well. Um, if you wanted to look at what the old state of the table was, this is not, you know, SED type two parlance. This is Snowflake uh, continue, continuous data protection parlance. You can run a time travel query against it, right? So uh, it's up to 90 days before on standard Snowflake tables. You run a query that says, uh, I want to see what the table looked like uh, 10 days ago, 50 days ago, up to 90 days ago. You can see what the table looked like before those updates actually occurred, right? Um, this is incredibly powerful functionality on Snowflake and, and why there's been such a buzz about, you know, how Snowflake manages its, its tables and, and so on. It's because you can not only... Uh, query the table as it was back in time, but you can also do what they call a zero copy clone. So what that what that means is is I can copy a table without actually copying the meta the the, the micro partitions. What happens in Snowflake? The metadata is copied instead. So when the pointers, which is the metadata, is copied, they're they're looking at the same micro partitions. So if I do changes against the 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 copy or the clone, then the original uh, copy does not see it. It's a snapshot of the table at a point in time. So, which is why that the whole um, uh, zero copy clone happened so quickly. So you could take a, a, a billion row uh, table, do a zero copy clone, and it's done, you know, in seconds. Um, of course, physical limitations or physical realities apply. If you were to clone an entire database, there's time that needs to take for the metadata pointers to be copied. But still, it's a lot quicker than, you know, physically copying uh, tables from one location to another. Uh, so that's the one functionality that's really nice to, to, to have out of, out of uh, um, uh, Snowflake tables, the native functionality to do zero copy cloning. What happens when we try to do queries against this table? Um, as as the, the documentation shows and the way you should do it is you look at how you can take advantage of pruning. So it's just a fancy term to say, 
I am trying to find which micropartitions will, will res resolve this query that I'm after. So for example, if I'm just after the key three and the acts of micropartitions, I'm only going to look at one micropartition here. And if I just add uh, one more portion to the where clause, then I'm going to only return the, the active record out of that micropartition, right? Again, all of that stuff is not something that you worry about. All you see is a table, but it is important to understand how the table is clustered. And as new, new data is loaded, um, it naturally clusters by load date because that's what we use in our data warehouse, right? So um, what does that look like from a, snow, so from a data vault perspective? Um, as we know, Data Vault 2.0 is insert only. Um, so when we define a satellite table, um, we create the table without a physicalized end date. We instead create a view that executes a lead function that calculates that end date, right? So when you're loading new records, it looks the same. Um, the view then shows what the, the end date is for that record. Uh, what starts to look different is when you start doing updates. When you do an update, you're actually not updating the table itself. It's still an insert. And when you query that data, it then shows, um, you know, uh, what the active record is. The downside of it is that you're calculating that lead function every time you're trying to figure out which is the, the uh, active record, right? Um, should I check the questions or should I leave it later? Anything for me to look at, uh, Alex? Uh, so far, we only have one question. Oh, I'm sorry, two questions. Yeah, um, if you want to answer those, or we can wait till the end. Up to you. Uh, yeah. So th those questions. I mean, look, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just the way it's it's loaded. There's no fancy algorithm that's running on the platform to go. Oh, I've detected load date. I've detected start date. I need to cluster it this way. It's just the way you land the data, right? And because we landed in load date order. Uh, we naturally do because load date is when the data enters the warehouse, the tables naturally cluster that way, right? So later on, you might you might see uh, like, a, a, like here, record ID three, um, it's not clustered that way because the record has arrived that way, but the load date increases, right? It's just the way uh, the, the, physically the, the, the data is landed onto the platform. So no no fancy tricks over there. Um, so if there I was, continue here, there was one more, if, uh, is, is it good practice to have files sorted or does Snowflake do that on load to make the compression better? So, um, we will get to that <laughs> as part of yeah, that, the cool. performance okay. and, and, and whatnot. Um, yes, the, the alternative way, instead of asking Snowflake to cluster it for you is to pre-order it and load it, but then, you know, somewhere down the line somebody's doing that ordering so somebody's paying for that ordering whether you like it or not if you if you ask snowflake to do it or if you ask or if you do it preloading into snowflake somewhere is doing the ordering if i can put it that way thank you uh all right so what it means to um uh, i'll get rid of this out of the screen sorry about that When you're running a query um, and you're looking for key ID three, now suddenly we return two micropartitions instead of one, right? And then we rely on that calculation of that end date to figure out uh, which is the right micropartition to return. So there's some scanning involved, which is not great. Um, so part of the, the demo that I would run about a year ago was this concept of um, pruning, static pruning, and how to get around the fact that we can't rely on end dates being physicalized in Data Vault 2.0. Um, how do we get how do we deal with it in Snowflake? Since Snowflake doesn't have indexes, right? Uh, what's the magic trick? So um, I did a demo with 61 million records, and the task was: all right, let me get to the active record. And this ran for 50 seconds. Not too bad. It's still below the, 50, the 60 second charge for a warehouse. Um, after, after six seconds, uh, Snowflake charges every second after that. So you need to make sh sure you use that those 60 seconds wisely, right? Um, 
50 seconds is not bad, but, you know, what happens when we upsize the warehouse? So I went from an extra small to an extra large. And um, yeah, of course, it, it, it ran much faster. Um, but keep in mind that if you go that size, it's 128 times the credit that you will spend just to get from 50 seconds to 5.5 seconds, right? Um, there is a way around it. Of course there is. Um, in Snowflake, it's not, in my opinion, not advertised enough, is what we want to do is make use of something called a join filter. So the way it works is um, you set up uh, what I call a C pit or a current pit. Basically what's in that pit is just a lookup table to say, what is my ID and what is the date that I need to look up for in that satellite table? And it's a current pit because I'm only interested in what's the active record, right? So what happens is, is when you run a query, you're actually running an equijoin between the two. And the speed of the query is sped up significantly because what happens underneath is that Snowflake recognizes that one of these tables is a lookup table uh, because of the size and, and we're, we're executing an equijoin and does internally what's called a bloom filter, um, which is, which is a, a probabilistic algorithm <clears throat> that Snowflake uses to determine um, <clears throat> which micropartitions definitely don't have the record you're after and which micropartitions might have the record you're after. So we call it dynamic pruning. And the result of it, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, is that we're passing less data through the, the architecture and using less bandwidth in the network. And my speed on an extra small was faster than uh, extra large, X4 large, um, at 128 times the credit. Now, I, I did test this out. I thought, ah, well, this is good. What happens if I do switch to an extra extra four light or four X large? It actually was slower. And the reason for that is because Snowflake deploys these, these nodes in the cluster. And when it does so, it has to schedule the work to each of the nodes. Like it determines, all right, you handle this portion, you handle that portion. And that activity takes a second to run. So it was actually 5.5 seconds. It was slower to, to run on a larger warehouse than an extra small warehouse, right? And uh, again, a lot of these details are are in uh, the the slide deck, uh, so the blogs. Uh, so, join performance, joining against a large table, uh, what to look out for, millions of records, and and so on. Uh, let me switch back. Right. Uh, no questions for that. So that's excellent. It's clear as mud. So what is um. This, this sort of um, functionality is really useful uh, uh, in Kimball modeling as well, because when you're de designing your facts and dimensions, your date dimension acts like a lookup table. So it would do a join filter against that, uh, 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 the rest of the fact table and dimensions and return the records only, only required for that date or that point in time that you're trying to get out of, out of a dimension. So. Does this mean that when we're loading data into Snowflake, we need to use, um, or into Data Vault rather, we need to use the current pit to do that? Not quite. So the optimal way to load a satellite table is to execute what's called an anti-semi join. Um, it's a fancy name for where not exists, right? What Snowflake does underneath it, it recognizes that staged table as a lookup table and say, oh, I'm going to look at the, the satellite table and actually execute a join filter anyway. So it's optimal um, load performance for getting data into a satellite table would just be, just to be, to be using uh, uh, where not exists. Very simple. So uh, the earlier question about clustering and then natural clustering and so on. This is where it gets really interesting, um, especially from here and onwards when we talk about clustering and joining and so on. So absolutely from from selecting from a single table, um, you know, static pruning look, works really well, but we know that in Data Vault, uh, we're going to do a lot of joins. So the emphasis for the, for the rest of the presentation is, okay, how do we optimize joins? How do we keep performance within Snowflake, right? Uh, however, what a really cool or useful tool to learn and understand how to use is the uh, cluster information function. 
So basically, when a table has not been clustered yet, it's still natural clustering, I can run this function against this table to figure out um, uh, and include the column name that I want to figure out the clustering on and determine how spread that the values of this column is across the micro partitions, right? The thing is, like, uh, 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 for most cases or most analytics, you're going to look at the current records in your, your satellite. But if you have other requirements where you need to get, you know, uh, data that's in a different order out of the same satellite table, how do you cater for that uh, for these other use cases when you know that most of the use cases are catered for uh, in the natural load order of a table? Uh, and, and that's where you look at things like uh, uh, pits and bridges uh, from a data vault perspective, or you start to look at other techniques that's with available in Snowflake, like uh, search optimization services, uh, the new dynamic tables, materialized views, and, and that kind of stuff. So what's really cool about this 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 tool, right? Um, before I clustered this this sixty million record table, that's what it looked like on the left hand side. Uh, basically, I had a total partition count, and I had uh, overlap values and depth. So basically, what that's telling me is that certain values or the the value that I'm looking for in the load date sometimes overlaps between micro partitions, right? Um, and the histogram with most of the, the the numbers of that histogram on the top of the histogram is a good uh, distribution of the keys, right? Um, when I executed the, the the clustering by the load date, you wait about um, uh, 40 seconds to a minute on uh, 61 million records, because it's, it's not immediate. It, Snowflake actually does the work to rewrite micro partitions in the back end. Um, the clustering looks better. Like my overlap is is uh, and depth is one, you know that's that's brilliant, and you can also notice that that uh, the micro partition count is smaller, which also might mean that my uh, storage footprint has reduced, right? Because uh, I said earlier it's encrypted, it's compressed by default. Therefore, if more content is in less micro partitions, the compression could be even better, right? Now, is it worth it? We'll see in the in the in the, in the rest of the, the the presentation because this act of actually or telling Snowflake to cluster is not free, right? So um, we'll talk about pits um, and how they help. So about a year ago, I did do a blog and demonstration on how pits and snow pits can be used to improve joint performance uh, for your data vault tables. So in this example here, I had 70 million records in one satellite, 17 in another, 150,000 in my business vault satellite, and only 150,000 accounts, right? Um, using an extra small um, without a pit, basically joining all the content together with no central pit involved, the query ran for eight and a half minutes, but notice how much traffic that, that I generated just from doing that joint, right? When I switch to a pit, um, a pit table, uh, the the network is is like a fraction, right, a, a tenth of of the, the original network traffic, and my performance is down to to less than twenty seconds. When I used a sequence number only pit, where I'm just using inc the the temporal sequence number from each satellite table to do the join, I shave off or leave even more seconds out of the join, right, and and you can notice straight away one. My micro partition count is less, my scanning is less, my network traffic is, is less, right? Um, and for those not initiated with pits and snow pits, uh, basically this is how it works. You designate a start and end date for the snapshot that you want to take of the uh, hash keys and load dates of satellites around a hub or link. And then you fill in what load dates and keys are applicable for that snapshot date, right? And you, you say like uh, 1st of Jan to the 31st of Jan, you can take a snapshot every day or once a week or however you want to do it. Uh, with the snow pit, it's just a single column. We designate an auto increment column in each uh, satellite. So you don't have to populate it yourself. You just define it in the DDL. And when you, when you build your pit, instead of picking the, the hash keys and load dates, you just pick the, the, that increment column instead. And then that reduces the, the amount of traffic that goes through the network, right? But the thing that you're really after, um, why this works so well and why it was 
eight minutes to 20 seconds is not just about the network traffic. It was also about the algorithm that runs underneath, right? So when you execute an, a query on Snowflake or you're building a model on Snowflake, you're doing left joins, uh, inner joins, right joins, and so on. Snowflake looks at the statistics of each table and then decides what type of algorithm to join those tables together, right? Uh, the two main um, types of algorithms are the left deep joint tree and the right deep joint tree. You also get something in the middle called the bushy tree, but that's not the focus here. A left deep jo joint tree would take two, result two tables, uh, do a nested loop against one table against the other, come up with a result, and then take the next table and do the same thing over and over, sort of in the leftward fashion. Whereas the right deep joint tree takes the hashes of each table because it's recognized that the middle table is larger than the, the surrounding tables and does, it builds those hash, hash tables and does a probe against that, that middle table. For us, it's a pit table. For facts and dimensions, it's the fact table, right? So the way this, the snow pit works is kind of very similar to how facts and dimensions work. It's hitting that middle table using the single joint column, right? So that's well, well and good. What I did, um, because we were getting customers with much larger uh, satellite tables asking us questions like, uh, how do you improve performance here? How do you deal with, with hundreds of millions of rows, billions of rows? So I did just that. I took the same example, rebuilt the, the, the sample data and uh, built it uh, using binary hash keys, uh, text-based hash keys, and natural key data vault. Um, and then also uh, made use of that auto increment column when, when joining all together in the snow pit. So when joining this data together without a pit, using this, this sort of uh, um, uh, uh, example, I upsize to a four XL because a X small won't do. Um, it's memory allocation on X small is one node. It'll take forever to run. So for, for a four XL um, unclustered, it ran for just under 17 minutes on binary hash, um, a second longer on a text hash and much better on a natural key data vault. Um, what you'll notice is when I clustered, um, the joint performance got worse. <laughs> and I tested this over and over again. So, okay, the storage footprint is better. Um, it's much smaller, but the join isn't isn't that great. You know, um, still 16 minutes, long time to wait for hundreds of millions of records, at least for Snowflake users. So um, what I did is, of course, I, I built the same thing. I went ahead and uh, built uh, snapshot pits. So taking a start and end date and ran the, the pit load code based on the, the already populated um, data vault tables, so the, the hubs and, and, and satellites, and created um, you know, uh, daily, weekly, and monthly snapshots of those tables. What I found was very interesting, and um, before I reveal the answer, maybe someone will jump in with why, why it happens, uh, but I'll reveal it anyway. Uh, so for the joint performance, it was horrendously bad. <laughs> Lack of a better word. Um, so somehow the pit uh, text-based uh, pit hash keys was the standout performer, but it was slower than joining content together without a pit. You know, it ran for 24 minutes. Our best time was 16 minutes without a pit. Uh, when I clustered it, uh, snow pit got better, um, 29 minutes. Uh, the clustered got better under under 16 minutes. Uh, but if you also notice, uh, the pit table size as well was nearly 9 billion records, right? So it's a hefty amount of records to take snapshots of and, and get that that time. Still, it's a seven minutes. It's pretty good. Um, with the weekly pit, which was, uh, you know, 1.2 billion records of snapshots, so 52 times, 52 snapshots for the year. Uh, some of the, the run times were worse than the daily, than the 8.8 8 .8 billion, which is, you know, counterintuitive to how physics apply, apparently. Uh, when I clustered it, things started getting better. Snow pit, for some reason, got worse, which I could, could not explain. Uh, 
And then when I went to to uh, monthly uh, snapshots, so two snapshots for 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 the year, the numbers look better, but it's not the same as combining all the records together without a pit, right? So uh, clustered looked all right, unclustered a little bit better, and natural key pit, uh, natural natural key pit seemed to be the winner, right? Uh, so what I did instead is uh, as well to test a lot of this functionality out is also build a an alternative version of pit, uh, incremental pits. So basically, within the orchestration of loading these uh, uh, satellites and and hubs. I include a step just afterwards to take the key that's ready now and the load date and incrementally load the the uh, pit as as it's been as as the keys as the business keys and load dates are available is started loading. So what I started to find right away is that my performance improved significantly. But what you'd also notice is that the size of my pit is already, you know, a fraction of the snapshot pit. Um, you know, 1.5 billion, 8.8 .8 billion, but even that number, 1.5 billion, is comparable to the 1.2 billion, and I'm running in one minute and a few seconds. You know, whereas the weekly pit was running in tens of minutes. So something is different. that's going on here. Uh, when I clustered it, uh, I got some performance gain. Uh, natural pit was now matching the snow pit unclustered. Uh, the weekly pits. Um, same thing was making more sense in terms of run times because the, the record counts were diminishing as well as, as clustered as well, um, started to make more sense, not too much difference between clustered and unclustered, um, and monthly, um, also started to see some improvements, uh, within the seconds, which is down below the, the 60 second range. Now, here's the first opportunity for anybody to put up their hand and say, why is this happening? Any clue? What is what is significantly different about running a snapshot pit and incrementally building a pit? Is it table scans? As the, as the... <laughs> table size is one thing. Table, sure. table scanning is less table scan. Okay. Any other ones? I'll I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, skew. So uh, <laughs> um, what I what I did is um, yeah, th these numbers didn't make any sense. Even when the tables were larger and there was a difference between clustering and not clustering, and somehow the the weekly uh, uh, tables were slower than the daily tables. The numbers didn't didn't make sense at all. So uh, I've also published a, a blog on. on how to come to these um, uh, numbers. Uh, basically, I used the coefficient of skewness from Pearson. And what those numbers would tell you, I'll switch back shortly, is that um, if the number of, uh, of the calculated skew is greater than, or, sorry, less than minus one, uh, for some reason, let's jump to the top of the screen. If it's greater than, than uh, uh, one and less than minus one, then we have high, highly skewed data, right? If it's between minus one and 0 0.1, then it's moderately skewed. And if it's between 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, we've got a sort of an even bell curve to our skewness, right? So switch back. Um, on the right-hand side, we got a lot of skew. On the left-hand side, we got moderately skewed or almost an even bell curve. So what this looks like and what I mean by, by, by a skewness is when you take a snapshot of the data at a point in time, right? Uh, it's not guaranteed that the business key that you're retrieving, let's say on the 1st of October, existed on the 1st of Jan. So when you're, building, when you're running your snapshot pit, what are you doing is you're filling in the, those, those records with no match with ghost records. And for a snapshot pit this size, there's going to be a lot of them, right? Uh, which to Snowflake it ge generates a, a large amount of skew in the probe side of the table, which I'll get into shortly. So to, to emphasize the point, um, I go down to running stats, right? Uh, 
the blue line is the ghost record count where for a business key, I've got nothing but ghost records from all the satellites. There's no existence of a business entity from those satellites at that point in time. And as, as the, the, the um, uh, snapshot table grew as it's building out, the number of those ghost records reduced to almost nothing because, you know, my end date being the 31st of December, I have all my, my business keys. There is, of course, uh, records where a satellite gets a business record, business uh, attributes about a business key and another satellite doesn't. That's some skew. And, uh, and of course, for the majority, um, well, towards the end of the snapshot table, you'd have even distribution where you have records coming in from all satellites, right? So that's that's what a snapshot distribution looks like. Exaggerated, of course, because I wanted a, the graph to look good. Building a, a incremental pit rather does this. There is no, um, you know, complete ghost count. There is no ghost skew. There are some ghost records because sometimes it arrives. You know, first um, of October uh, attribute arrives, and the second of October the other satellites attribute arrives for the same business key. Sure. There's some ghost, but the bulk of that ghost uh, skew is gone. So the way the way uh, skew is dealt with in a right deep join tree on the build side for the satellite tables or dimension table in effects and dimensions, Snowflake can dynamically deal with that, no problem. It's the probe side where Snowflake would struggle, right? There is a way around it. Um, and then that's ignoring the fact that I just got an incremental piss because that in, uh, emphasizes orchestration and from time to time you would have to rebuild the pits anyway um so we take our best numbers that we got from the snapshot pit and what i got is similar performance to incremental pit queries just by dealing with with the, those uh, uh uh ghost skew or probe sized skew so the the query the query map or the query profile ends up looking like this. So now I've got two right deep join trees. So what, what I've effectively done is I've written the query in such a way that I want to deal with the records that find matches in the in the, the the pit table and the satellite and isolate those from everything that's ghost, right? Um, what's significant about this query plan as well, you'll see is on the left-hand side, those records collapse to one record. It's beautiful, <laughs> which is why it, it performs so well. Um, back to that that blog. Um, no, some performance numbers. And that's the way we do, uh, I dealt with it. Basically, for the ghost only, um, this is for Snowpit. Um, I just look at what the ghost records are. For a pit, it would be the, the ghost hash and the load date. And for every other record, I just say I'll, I'll deal with that, you know, in the normal query pro, um, profile. What that means is that now the information mark is treating the pit as if it was an incremental pit. You know, the performance is the same. Um, of course, you, you can deal with it in a different way. You can build your pit in a different way to, let's say, build it to not persist those complete ghost records, but it depends on what you're trying to get out of the, the, the query itself. Like the, the, the standard way is to return the ghost, right? And to do that, you deal with it in the information mark. And then the query times are back to, to minutes uh, rather than hours or tens of minutes. Um, so the last thing to consider or second last thing to consider is of course, what we spoke about before. It is on the cloud. It is native cloud. It is an EC2 instance that's pulling data and you want to, to prune. You want to use dynamic pruning when you can, you want to use static pruning when you can, but also consider what, what, you're, what you're pulling in. Like, uh, of course, don't select every column if you don't need it. Um, but each, each column, each data type has um, the number of bytes it's persisted onto disk. If you can reduce that, then you're also better off, right? So natural keys are, are always varchar. Someone somewhere in, in one forum suggested doing binary for natural keys. I think the issue with that is that in order to use the natural key, you'd have to apply a binary function every time. So I don't know what the cost is like to, to execute that at every query. Probably not good. And probably doesn't save you a whole ton anyway if, if the natural key compresses by default in Snowflake. So even though you 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 specify varchar 40, what actually is, is stored is compressed. And that's the byte 
size that's that's on on disk itself. Now um, with the hash keys, um, the great thing about hash keys, you can combine multiple business keys into a single hash, include your business key, collision code, multi-tenant ID and all that, and you still have a single joint between tables. The downside is it doesn't compress, right? Uh, you, that's an example value there. If you assign Varchar 40, the actual size is gonna be 40 bytes anyway. Um, there's, there's no way around it. So that's why we always emphasize if you're gonna go for, for hash keys, which I think is still a good way uh, to deploy your data vault, um, go binary. Um, there's another reason which I'll show why, why binary is good, because uh, you store half the byte size. Snowpit uses that integer column that's managed by itself, so you don't have to manage it at all. So a combination of Snowpit and Nashville key could be your best option, potentially. You know, It depends on your compression. Uh, it depends on, on what the data that you're bringing together. Um, you know, it could, could be the right option for you. To finish off, to conclusion, uh, still good for time, plenty of time. Uh, so natural keys seems like the best way to do performance or to, to emphasize performance on the data vault on Snowflake. Um, but I do think that uh, hash keys or, or still have their place um, if you choose to do so. The reason is, uh, as I said, uh, business key collision code, multi-tenant ID into a single column, which is great. Um, for me, it's great because you know there's a single pattern to join satellite tables and hub tables, satellite tables and link tables and, and link tables and hub tables. Whereas uh, natural key, although my early example was quite generous in compression, your natural key might be different. It might be longer, it might be wider, it might be two business keys, it might be multiple, you know, who knows. And anyway, the, the natural key doesn't include the uh, collision code and multi-tenant ID. Um, think about pit tables. They're really useful. Uh, in Teradata parlance, they're the join index. So we do the same thing on Snowflake and you will get that performance um, as well out of Snowflake. Uh, you can think about using dynamic tables to do the same thing. Um, and what I mean by that is also a recent blog that I did, uh, building dynamic tables to actually um, not simulate, but build pit tables as dynamic tables instead, uh, which here, it, you know, kind of explains how it works, how it brings it together. It's actually a completely different way of building the traditional way pit, but the outcome is the same. Um, because the way dynamic tables work currently, they're still improving it. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on how you build dynamic tables. And the ones that I encountered trying to build a pit um, through the traditional mains, means is highlighted here. And I solved that, built a dynamic table, put the code on this page, by the way, um, how to do it, and also use the same concept to build or emphasize my uh, joint filters. So um, instead of building this complex um, sort of orchestrated table load to keep a, a current pit, a C pit up to date, all I did was, okay, well, define a dynamic table with a qualifier and it would always have my active records for that C pit. And then I included in my uh, virtual, my virtual view over the, the C pit and the satellite table and users of that satellite, satellite table view are oblivious to that join, but they get the benefits out of it, right? So without that join, 20 minutes. <laughs> With the join, 40 seconds. I mean, night and day. It's, it's just, you know, you have to use it. Uh, not necessarily dynamic tables, but however you do it. Other things to consider, uh, understand your join key distribution. So here I exaggerated the ghost key, uh, ghost record um, distribution to show you that, you know, what impact it has on the probe side of the join against a, a pit table or fact table, right? But also consider your business keys that you're loading that are not ghost records. Are you seeing poor performance? And it might be that certain business keys are just repeated so many times that there's so many updates to it that somehow in your information mod build that you, you would want to cater for that maybe separately, initially just to separate it out and union all the results so it collapses the, uh, um, that, that record. And then you get, you know, minute uh, query return times. 
Um, like I said, I think binary hash keys still has their place if you choose to do so. Um, the reason for this is architecturally. Um, I've been on many uh, um, uh, customer engagements where I hear something like, oh, um, can't we have the hash key as a text field? Why? Why do you want it? Uh, because uh, talent doesn't support binary or doesn't support raw. That for me implies that they're actually pulling the data into talent, doing that transformation and pushing it back onto Snowflake, which is a total anti-pattern, right? You should do everything in, in, in platform, which is the fastest way to, to run things. So when I hear things like that, I what are you doing? And, you know, guess what? I do have a blog about it, uh, which I said, uh, you might be doing data world wrong. When I hear they're using base64 to turn binary hash keys into text hash keys, they, what are you doing? Uh, I want to understand why you need this, right? Uh, and um, of course, it's not the only thing that you can use to to improve performance. We talked to, we spoke about uh, um, uh, pruning, dynamic pruning, algorithms and and network traffic as well. But let's say you do need to persist this data somewhere so that you can just process the new content. Uh, consider streams and tasks, which is another uh, sort of capability where, where you create a stream and the stream creates an offset on the table with all the new deltas on the table. And it only um, uh, processes that, that offset when you run a DML on top of that stream. So the next time you query that, 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 that stream, it'll be empty, but the table is still full because there's no new delta. So that's something also to consider. Also got a blog on how to do that. Um, and of course, network traffic, that's the big one. Uh, for me, that's where Snowpit combines a lot of this, um, you know, uh, business keys, um, uh, business key collision codes, multi-tenants ID, and also reduces the, 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 the traffic between uh, the remote storage and the, the application that you, that's using that storage in a predictable way. Uh, whereas natural key could be, you know, any sort of variance of what the natural key value is. And for your benefit, all of this stuff is on QR codes. So get out your cameras and just take pictures. 